Ready? Hello, and thank you, everyone. thank you to everyone for joining us this morning. I'm Kate Bond. I'm an economist here at the Washington Center for Equitable Growth. I know many of you are familiar with equitable growth, but for those who aren't, we're a research and grant-making organization dedicated to advancing evidence-backed ideas and policies that promote strong, stable, and broad-based economic growth. We're very thrilled to have Joan Williams, Susan Lambert, and Saravanan Kasavan with us to discuss the results of their multi-year look at scheduling stability policies at The Gap which was released yesterday along with exclusive coverage in the New York Times. Equal Growth is proud to have supported this research through our grants program, along with other funders, including support from The Gap. We know, that the importance of, we know the importance of having consistent, predictable schedule for a worker and his or her family. For example, Susan Lambert found that 80% of hourly workers report fluctuations in their hours worked week to week, with fluctuations as large as 38% of their usual weekly hours. And we know scheduling predictability is important for addressing income volatility and family economic security. And so many cities around the country are starting to recognize this and taking up scheduling stability policies. But what's the impact on business? Well, this new exciting research shows us. The work looked at the impact on employees and on the workplace. The multidisciplinary approach of the researchers allows us to look at all sides, and you'll hear more about this during the presentation. I have just a few notes before we get started. Um, the event is being live streamed, and we encourage people to join us via social media with the hashtag stable scheduling study. And I also want to let everyone know that we're having on April 24th from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. a research on tap happy hour conversation on pay equity and economic growth. And an invitation and location with more details will be coming soon. And so I know that everyone's eager to get to the details of this work, so I'll hand it over to our distinguished guests, and I'll just introduce them very briefly. We have Susan Lambert, who's an associate professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. And next to her is Joan Williams, who's the distinguished professor of law and the director of the Center for Work-Life Law at the University of California Hastings College of Law. And finally, uh, Saravanan Kasavan is associate professor and Sarah Graham Keenan Scholar at the University of North Carolina Keenan Flagler Business School. We request that questions are held for the Q&A at the end. And over to the researchers. Well, good morning. Our first results of the uh, from the stable scheduling study. And we really want to thank Equitable Growth for this opportunity. For the support for the project. Yeah. <laughs> I was doing so well. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to start with is what brought each of us to this project. Um, and is that working? I'm still getting feedback. Oh. <laughs> All right, it's, okay, here we go. Um, so I'm going to begin with what brought me to this project. I became interested in the quality of jobs in retail um, a long time ago when I was working at Sears and Roebuck at the, uh, the Briarwood Mall in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I worked there for, I, got my, I earned my five-year pin uh, and I worked there throughout college and um, beyond that. And what happened then was that I never knew, how, I worked part-time, I never knew how many hours I would get or how much I would earn and I really needed the money. And I was always willing to pick up shifts from my friend Vicki, who happened to have a lot more dates than I did. Fast forward about 20 years, and I'm doing an in-depth study of, of, four, of employers in four different industries, and everything is about labor hours, from the manager's point of view to the worker's point of view. Managers are scrambling around, looking at their hours, looking at their labor budgets, wondering who to send home, who not to, how many hours they're going to have for next week. And then from the worker's point of view, their hours are flexing. They can't count on their hours just like I couldn't at Sears. And so after that study, uh, a colleague and I, Julia Henley, decided that instead of just trying to document all the carnage from these <laughs> scheduling practices, that we would actually try to improve them. And so we did a, a randomized uh, study in a national women's retail apparel firm that just focused on posting schedules further in advance, so improving predictability. We learned a lot from that study. We used a lot of kind of the approaches, the methodological approaches from that study in our study from uh, stable scheduling uh, study. Um, and one of the things that we noticed there was that, boy, workers' hours really varied a lot more than the sales did. 
and, and the managers were pretty darn good, really, if they thought about it, of predicting that variation. But somehow that didn't get passed on to the workers. So when Joan asked me to join um, the, um, uh, the team to be on the study, it just seemed like the logical next step in terms of developing feasible ways to improve scheduling practices and the quality of jobs in, uh, in retail. Uh, my name is Joan Williams at University of California. And what brought me to the study is that I've worked on work family issues for decades. Um, I was the first book I published on work family. Um, I've also been very interested in social class for decades. And um, so I, uh, I we published Work Life Law, the institute that I run, published the first study examining work life issues in the hour, among hourly workers in 2004. At that point, I was using union arbitrations to try to get a window into the experience of hourly workers. And then I discovered Susan's research, which I had been looking for for years, and I, I hadn't discovered because it didn't exist. And I actually left her a long, adulatory voicemail, <laughs> which she later told me she saved for months, yeah. <laughs> basically saying, Susan, you are the most awesome bomb. I am so happy you're alive and working. And, um, and, and then I, um, I wrote with Heather Boucher, of course, of, uh, who founded Center for Equitable Growth, um, a report that had been a gleam in my eye for, at that point, more than five years, called The Three Faces of Work-Family Conflict, The Poor, The Professionals, and The Missing Middle, try to, to try to communicate to the work-life community, which was large, that there were three very different problems to solve for. I tried to, I've always been very interested in using capitalism as a change lever because, you know, how much legislation have we passed lately? Uh, so I w wrote a report in 2011 called Improving Work-Life Fit in Hourly Jobs, um, a, something like a costs enhancing strategy in a globalizing world. Um, and I basically pointed out that um, unstable schedules were an artifact of flawed business metrics, that the, the purveyors of computerized scheduling had focused people's attention on what I called the front end labor costs, matching labor supply and labor demand in real time in a very tight way. But they, uh, if you achieve too tight a fit at the front end, you drive up what I call back-end labor costs, turnover, absenteeism, low worker engagement, all of that kind of thing. So I published that to a crashing silence. It made no difference whatsoever. Um, and so I was at a conference at Stanford when the then head of HR at Gap, Eric Severson, um, said, was talking about <clears throat> results-oriented work environment, that they, which they had implemented at GAP headquarters. Um, sort of show up when you want, do your work where you want, just get your work done. It's kind of cutting-edge work-family stuff. And I went to Eric and I said, I could give you um, the same thing for hourly workers. And that was the start of the GAP um, stable scheduling study. So um, what we did is, um, you can see we finally got our, our business metrics. We finally got our business, business results, as you'll see. Um, what we did is we had first an eight-month pre-pilot. And during the pre-pilot, we worked with very intensively with three stores in the San Francisco area to try to figure out what we were going to do. And Susan's initial instinct, being a rigorous social scientist, was to do what she'd done before, which is to change one thing and measure the results, which of course is the most elegant approach. Me being a mere lawyer is like, no, no, we're going to change the whole ecosystem. Um, and we ultimately ended up changing seven different business practices um, at once. The, um, one of the things that we did is um, we eliminated on calls. Um, I, had, we had, I was actually reluctant to do that because the store managers were kind of panicked at the thought of eliminating on calls. It was actually Eric Severson, the head of HR at The Gap, that said, we had a conversation where he was a little crestfallen. He said, you're not going to eliminate on calls? And I went, well, guess we are. 
And that's how that happened. Um, we did um, what, uh, a, a riff on what Susan had done before, we did two weeks notice. She had done a month's notice. But then um, we also, for the full pilot, um, which was out in nearly 30 stores in the San Francisco and Chicago areas for different, roughly a year, we did five other things. Uh, because at the end of our pre-pilot, um, partly because of the good results of the pre-pilot, and partly because of other issues, GAP rolled out elimination of on-calls and for and 14 days notice enterprise-wide for all stores in the country. Um, we did five other things in the intervention stores. One is what had kept the pre-pilot um, delayed so long. It was supposed to be three months. It was eight months. And we, um, we gave people a app called Shift Messenger. There are a number of them out there that allowed people to swap shifts through smartphone in real time. This is one of the keys that I'd identified in the 2011 report, which didn't quite exist yet. But that was hugely important, and you'll, we'll talk about the results. We also did um, a stable shift structure. We had managers commit to doing all of the following things to the extent consistent with business needs. Stable shift structure. So shifts began and ended at roughly the same times. Um, core scheduling. So um, giving more associates a core schedule that was unchanging over the weeks. Uh, what we uh, I christened part time plus a twenty plus hour um, um, for for twenty one years and then I when I came to the U S I was an engineer and then at some point I decided to you know go back to my original passion which is retail operations so so I did my PhD in retail operations and uh, to those of you who are not familiar with the operations management area and the business school so operations management deals with the design and delivery of products and services to customers. So we tried to figure out what would be the most optimal way, uh, what would be the optimal way to deliver these products and services. We care about efficiencies and all of those different business metrics that, uh, that retailers uh, care about. So uh, uh, about 10 years back, I started working with, uh, with some retailers looking at their uh, labor scheduling issues. And uh, what got me into the field is this new technology that was new at that point, which is these traffic counters that retailers started installing at the, uh, at the front of the store to keep track of the, tra uh, you know, the number of customers coming into the store. So now this traffic information was very valuable because now retailers can have insights into uh, lost sales. Right, so typically, retailers look at the point of sales information to figure out how much sales they made, but they could never understand, you know, figure out how much lost sales happened, which is customers walking to the store and leaving without purchasing. So traffic actually turned out to be a very valuable tool, and uh, my research was looking at how <coughs> matching the supply, which is the labor, with the traffic actually led to higher sales and profitability. So while I was going down that path, there was this one project, uh, which probably was the one that uh, attracted Susan at that point, so where we uh, looked at you know, the impact of uh, part-time workers and temporary workers in a large Fortune 50 retailer. So we looked at about 450 stores, and uh, what, you know, what we actually observed was that you know, flexibility, which we often tell our MBA students is, is the is the tool to use against variability is, is not an unalloyed good when it comes to retail labor. So having too much of flexibility in terms of part-time workers and temporary workers was actually leading to, it was resulting in higher sales and profitability up to a certain point, but then it was causing both sales and profitability to drop. Now, <clears throat> Susan, Susan's work has largely I mean, has been on the employee side looking at how you know, this flexibility is harmful for employees. And then uh, you know, I had my research saying that flexibility is actually harmful for the retailers as well beyond a point. So that actually got to the meeting of minds, and then I got uh, you know, involved with this wonderful team to work on the GAP project. So now we're going to turn to the results. So um, we are the results? <coughs> Did we increase schedule stability? And the answer is yes, some. A bit. Um, we defined schedule stability as having multiple dimensions, which we targeted through the, the different components that Joan just reviewed. 
In terms of schedule consistency, for example, did were people working more consistent times, days, and uh, evenings, uh, mornings over time? We found that the intervention improved that kind of consistency. It also improved the consistencies of people's exact start and end times, and also the consistency of the number of hours that they worked from week to week. In terms of predictability, which we were able to measure by comparing the actual original schedule to what people clocked in and out every day, GAP provided us with an incredible amount of uh, data, hard data that you can read about in the report. The intervention improved the predictability of the timing of hours, uh, and a lot of that predictability was driven by fewer changes to the end time, so fewer shift extensions and fewer uh, people leaving work uh, early before their scheduled shift had ended. Uh, but the intervention did not improve the predictability of the number of hours uh, associates worked from week to week. And in fact, in weeks uh, when the intervention was going, associates worked about 20 minutes less than they were originally scheduled. And compared to um, times when the intervention wasn't going, they worked about five minutes more than originally scheduled. Some of that can, is probably the result of the use of shift messenger. Uh, that we can look at and our and the use of shift messenger and kind of the 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 changes in work hours highlight something that I had found in previous research was that often retail workers because they don't have a guaranteed minimum number of hours they trade somewhat the number of hours they work for schedule control so in weeks that shift messenger uh, workers use that on average people lost about an hour of work uh, compared to what they were scheduled to work. Now, this trade-off between schedule control and hours seems one that many associates made quite willingly. Uh, they overwhelmingly <laughs> reported on the surveys that they really liked Shift Messenger. Um, our employees in treatment stores report more input into their schedule uh, than those in control stores. And the majority of associates use Shift Messenger uh, 62 percent of all associates in the treatment stores use shift messenger to either post or pick up a shift or uh, to do both and even people 50 years or older which we wondered if you know kind of older workers they seem young to me at this point um, but would use um, the app and over you know 50 percent of them had used the app as well the effect of the intervention on adequacy of our so we increased input, but the, the I think the more complex um, finding that we have is whether the intervention increased the adequacy of hours. So did people get more hours as a result of this? And adequacy did improve for our part-time plus people. Uh, they got um, 20 or more hours, you know, the majority of weeks and more than they did before the intervention. But the intervention did not improve the adequacy of hours for other associates, at least not on average. And in fact, during intervention weeks, associates in treatment stores were scheduled for almost an hour less than associates in controlled stores during the same periods of, of time, you know, the same seasons. Now, you might be thinking that that's because those extra hours to part-time plus people were taken out of you know, uh, the other associates. But we have done so many analyses to try to find that kind of trade-off, and we just do not find it. We continue to look, but that does not seem to be the story here. But the key point is, is that our intervention did not move the needle on providing additional hours to most sales associates. And about half of the sales associates uh, in both control and treatment stores reported on the survey that they would like to work more hours at the gap. I'd like to highlight just a couple of other additional findings. As Joan mentioned, a gap moved forward with eliminating on calls and posting schedules two weeks in advance, uh, right as we were launching uh, our full experiment. And these two practices are key to a lot of the scheduling legislation that's taking place today. They're in most of the municipality laws. They're in the Schedules That Work Act that's been introduced into uh, Congress. We cannot tease out the effects of those two practices on employees or on, on the business outcomes, but what we can do is uh, say that the stores in our study complied with both of those mandates. Um, GAP basically terminated the use of at least formal on-calls by just canceling in their system the ability to schedule them. <laughs> and so, you know, 
click off a switch. You can't do that anymore. Um, and you know, and at least our interviews and our data do not suggest that as a result of that, managers started writing them in somehow on the side or canceling shifts. What we do see in treatment stores is that an associate might post a shift that she didn't want anymore on shift messenger. And before another coworker could pick it up, a manager might step in and cancel that shift. Um, so it wasn't really canceling the person's shift, but it was reducing it from um, the labor budget. And we do see a, a number of times that that happened. In terms of the two-week advance notice, some managers did struggle to do this. There were three stores where there was just really never top management stable the whole time, and they had a very difficult time getting that schedule up on time. But excluding those three stores, 90% of schedules were published at least two weeks in advance during our experiment. Um, you know, managers were given these mandates and they complied. They found out how to, they figured out how to make their numbers without those on calls and posting two weeks in advance. Let me end by saying that although the intervention we developed and evaluated significantly increased schedule consistency and predictability, the improvements seem quite modest to us. And I'm going to give you just a couple quick examples. One is when we look at the uh, difference in the consistency of scheduled end times. End times are 13% more consistent in the intervention condition than in the control condition. But what does that mean? On average, only 34% of associate shifts were scheduled to end at the same hour during the intervention compared to 30% uh, in the control condition. So there's still a lot of instability there. And the number of hours for part-time associates varied quite a bit from week to week. Among part-time workers, hours varied by about six hours on average from week to week. And that's a, a lot when you consider that on average, part-time associates were averaging 17 hours per week. So there's a lot of inconsistency and instability out there uh, that might yet be tamed. And um, the modest um, you know, kind of taming <laughs> that we were able to accomplish in this study, I think it's you know just all that you know. It's so it's so interesting that the business results are so strong, which Sarah Vaughan is going to talk about now. Given that we moved, you know, we took a few steps in the direction of stability. Before we talk about the business results, I just want to talk about two important assumptions that <coughs> retailers often tend to make. Um, the first is that uh, a lot of schedule instability that you witness is, uh, is assumed to be driven by the customer traffic arrival pattern. So if you take a retail store, uh, you know, there are more customers coming in, say, between 11 and 2 during the peak times. And even during the days of the week, there's more customers coming in during Saturdays and Sundays. So what that would mean is having a stable, perfectly stable schedule is going to uh, it's not going to be possible. So that's one, that the traffic variability is driving the schedule variability. Second is that having a stable schedule would actually lead to lower profitability because if you have a completely stable schedule, then you're not matching supply with demand. So what we did in the study is actually you know, test both of these assumptions and turns out both are incorrect. So first is uh, regarding the traffic variability. So because Gap installed these traffic counters that I mentioned earlier, they were, you know, these stores were able to keep track of the number of customers coming in. So when we <clears throat> ran a correlation between the traffic variability and the schedule variability, turned out only 30% of the variability in the schedules are actually explained by traffic variability. All right, so, and this is a result that I actually find in a different uh, departmental store as well. So it seems to be, I mean, at least more than one retailer, we find that similar consistent finding. So the question is, why is there that? What happens to the remaining 70 percent? Uh, Joan will talk about that next. Uh, but moving on to the second result, that having a stable schedule will actually lead to low profitability because of these variabilities, is also not true because, you know, as Susan mentioned, we managed to improve the stability by just a little bit. But when we looked at the business performance, specifically on sales, we found that the sales went up by 7 percent. Now. Needless to say, a 7% increase in sales in general is, is very high. And especially if you think about how we increased the sales. We didn't, you know, typically a retailer would increase sales by driving more traffic into the stores. We did not increase traffic through driving, uh, we did not increase sales through driving traffic. 
but we actually you know, provided stable schedules to the associates who possibly provided get better customer service and led to higher conversion rates and basket values. <clears throat> In fact, when we start uh, looking at the underlying mechanisms, turns out you know, we want to see why the sales went up and we observed that the labor productivity in those stores where we on the experiment went up by 5%. And we were further curious on, to find out why the labor productivity went out. And we looked at uh, you know, the, the uh, st uh, stability uh, for the experienced versus inexperienced workers. Turns out that the stability for the experienced workers has actually increased. Now, for the inexperienced workers, it has not increased. It was pretty much the same. But we were glad that it didn't go, go down either. So it wasn't a zero-sum game where the retailers made some workers better off and uh, at the cost of the others. And finally, when we looked at the turnover rate of these employees, we found a significant drop in the turnover among the more experienced workers. So. As the managers provided greater stability to the more experienced workers, their turnover dropped, and this possibly led to a higher labor productivity, driving the sales up by 7%. I think that is the overall business finding that, uh, that we have from the retail gap study. Very counterintuitive, because of course, um, many people might say, what business is doing is already efficient. Why would you need regulation? Because that would just corrode efficiency. But what we found is that um, what business is doing in this context, in fact, is corroding their ability to increase sales. Uh, so why did that happen? Now, remember that when we were designing the intervention, um, we, uh, my feeling was we want to go in and change the whole ecosystem. And so we changed these seven different scheduling practices. What we found in the course of the experiment is that we actually, um, to my uh, some sadness, we didn't change the whole ecosystem, because the assumption had already has always been that scheduling instability was driven driven by customer traffic in the stores, but we found that was not the case. Um, we don't have quantitative data, so I can't say 70% is attributable to A, B, and Z, but we have mountains of qualitative data. We were in these stores every two weeks, some of them for um, years. And what the qualitative data strongly suggested was um, what we christened um, headquarters instability drivers, HQ instability drivers. And there were three. The first had to do with the design of marketing promotions. In one study week, for example, promotions in the Gap stores that we were studying changed three different times. So you have one, first of all, you had a stylist promotion where you had to go and grab various stock and then re, uh, reprice all of that stock. That's a lot of labor hours. And then the second one is they like, we're not, that isn't working. So then they came and said, well, we're going to put all trousers on 30% off. So then you have to get this, rearrange the stock, put up tables, print sun, another big labor hit. And then they said, oh, that's not working, so we're just going to put everything off 50%. So you have to do the, the same thing again. That was the source of a tremendous amount of labor instability schedule instability. The second major HQ driver of instability um, was shipments. Um, we again and again, we found the store managers told us there had been changes to either the date of the shipment or the number of units or both. So when you think about it, if you were expecting 5,000 units on Tuesday and you got 2,000 units on Thursday, first of all, you have to cancel everybody who you scheduled on Tuesday because there's no 5,000 units to unpack. And then you have to scramble and find people for Thursday who were not originally scheduled because you weren't scheduled for a shipment on Thursday. And so those were two huge sources of instability that um, we had not addressed because we were approaching this as everybody else was, as an HR issue, as just a scheduling issue. 
Um, the third major HQ driver was leadership visits. Um, so the CEO wants to really keep in touch with, you know, what's going on on the ground. So he decides he's going to visit. Well, the natural motivation, of course, is to turn the store in a, into a museum, um, a literal quote from one of the store managers. And then either leadership never shows up or they show up for 15 minutes. Um, or even if they show up, you've taken all of that. Um, and then, you know, leadership schedule changes. And then you have to, so that was the third major um, source of instability. Now, uh, that helps suggest why the shift to, to stability was so modest. We were assuming that the instability came from the stores, but no, actually, a lot of the instability comes from headquarters. And so you think about it, why would stores, why would headquarters, after all, just full of very smart people, we found very smart people as store managers, typically without college degrees, and we found very smart people at headquarters. Um, and we, I have to say, we are deeply, we're deeply grateful to Gap. It's not every company that would do this, that would invite real uh, researchers in, help, help us download their HR data, look in detail at their HR data, have no control over our findings. Um, and you just, you know, in talking about GAP, I really think it's important, incumbent on all of us to realize this is not typical corporate practice. Um, and hats off to GAP for really doing this. But when you go back and think about it from the point of view of market theory and capitalism, like why would they be passing up a 7% increase in sales? That's huge in retail, which is very low margin. Um, it's really because of different of communication problems between headquarters and the stores and different incentives in headquarters and the stores. Labor costs are 85% of controllable costs in retail. So you're a finance guy sitting in retail who has to make your numbers for the quarterly report. What's the easiest way to do it? Cut labor hours. Ah, there's a lot of fat in the stores. There's a lot of, uh, you know, it'll be probably be fine. Well, it's actually not fine. Sarah Vaughan and his colleagues have documented huge execution problems in retail, sloppiness and execution of company policies. But the finance guys, make their numbers. And that's actually what, um, that's the center of power. So um, the other thing that happens is that a lot of what's going on in the stores doesn't, um, the information just never gets back to headquarters. Because the people in the stores, first of all, I think there might be a class element. They don't have college degrees. And there's also just a, they don't, that's not where the power in a company lies. And so they, the managers told us from the very beginning, if they would just give me more hours, I could sell through them. In other words, I could make so much more, more in sales. Um, we would make more money as a company. But that message doesn't get through. So there's a communications problem within the company. And um, what Sarah Vonin pointed me to is literature uh, on something that's called agency mis misattribution. In a company, a complex organization, when people are, have access to different information, often, instead of saying, I have access to different information, often they attribute the different interpretation of somebody in a different department to kind of a personality flaw. It's exactly what we found here. We found, um, particularly at the beginning, much less so at the end, people in, um, in headquarters saying the problem was emotional scheduling and that the store, manager, store managers were engaged in emotional scheduling. And um, so part of this also goes back to the purveyors of software who, um, as a marketing strategy, said, we are going to have you scheduling through science. Don't change a thing about these schedules. Any change is just emotional scheduling. And so you have this system of market failures um, because of the marketing of the software purveyors, because of the power differentials within departments at retailers, um, so that basically capitalism just isn't working efficiently in this context. And so we came out with this shocking result that companies could be earning seven, make 7% 7 higher um, sales, huge in retail. And um, the market wasn't delivering that result. Um, that has obvious implications for, um, for regulation.
mic is working? Yeah. Um, so we can open it up to Q&A. I just want to say thank you so much for this presentation. I think this is such fascinating research. I was so excited that I got to moderate this. Um, and I'm going to take advantage of being the moderator and ask the first question. Um, and I'm curious about the finding that workers end up working about an hour or less per week. And I'm wondering you know, what you can say about the degree to which workers are making sort of a rational decision, maybe the scheduling unpredictability has a great cost on workers. It could be childcare costs, it could be commuting costs, it could be all sorts of different costs, and workers are making a decision that one less hour of pay is worth it because then they have fewer other costs associated with uh, scheduling unpredictability. That's an average. Let me point that out to begin with, right? So that's an average, and when we look at kind of experimental effects, that's what we look at. Um, so there are some workers for whom that wouldn't work. For example, with, there are some workers who use shift messenger to just get more hours. There are other ones that used it to give up those shifts because maybe their kid was sick, or right? And so, um, but we have not looked yet in enough detail using all of our data to look at what those different patterns are. Whether people are calculating exactly, I'm going to give up an hour for this. I mean, do you do this in your life? I do not do this in my life. But I, I think that what our data overall that we've looked at show is, show is that something like Shift Messenger is a lot better to be able to give up your shift um, when you can't work next week or, you know, um, rather than the other, the forms that don't allow those kinds of sh swaps between em employees. So I think we have to compare their experience to what they had without the interventions that we put in. Um, up your job. And sometimes that's the choice. All right, great. All right. That was On the mic so that uh, people who are live stream. Oh, you have another mic. Okay. Thank you. This is really exciting and great work. Um, two questions. Uh, one is probably quick. I don't know enough about retail to know why sales is the preferred uh, metric for uh, outcomes or if it's, it, I mean, I would think something more along the lines of like profit so that you could see both both benefit to the store and cost, but that's maybe not available. So if, if you can talk a little bit about that as an outcome measure. Uh, and then the second is, um, can you talk about how meaningful the the finding that there wasn't a shift from, that the employer didn't shift from using full-time to using part-time work, or at least as far as you found, my, from my understanding was, or I'm sorry if I mischaracterized. We thought about um, shifting some people onto full-time part of the intervention, but um, that ultimately felt a little bit like playing with people's lives too much, um, and it, it just like it didn't happen for that reason. Okay. I, I guess I wasn't talking about as part of an intervention. I thought that you had mentioned in the outcomes that you didn't see ga the gap um, shift from using um, more full-time work to part-time work, but I could be wrong about that. I was basically wondering if uh, whether the gap has um, it, whether there are costs associated with full-time work, like benefits and so on. You're, 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 we didn't, um, people who had, were, had more hours or a greater um, experience got more stability, but the other group of people did not get less stability. But that's not part-time, full-time. I think that's what you're, gotcha. they were both part-time. They were all part-timers. They were all part-timers. Yeah. And they didn't, not they didn't get fewer hours than they had gotten before. Even though the part-time plus people got more hours, it didn't affect the number of hours. Right. So the question, why would we not look at profitability? Indeed, profitability would be a good metric to look at. Uh, we, uh, we did some calculations. So if you look at the interventions, uh, there is one component which d did require increased expenses, which is the additional targeted staffing where we recommended that the stores that we identified as being understaffed get a few more hours. And we went back and looked at how many hours the managers actually used. And based on that, our calculation was about $31,000 of uh, expense for labor. 
Now, if you look at uh, the total sales increase, we estimate it to be about $2.9 million. Right, so the return on investment on this is way over 99%. Now, uh, what we don't have in this calculation is the amount of time that managers spent, uh, the associates spent. So we don't have estimates, but we believe it's small enough that uh, you know, in terms of return on investment, this is highly profitable. And there were they, before the intervention, they spent, this is large stores, they spent like, I may be getting the numbers slightly wrong, but the amount amount of time spent doing the schedule decreased from something like two days to four hours. So we're assuming that there were increased costs. There may have actually been uh, saved costs as a result of the injury, but we don't have that data, bottom line. We don't have the data. I may have missed this, and I just wanted to clarify, were these um, voluntary or involuntary part-time workers? Measure that exactly, but we do know on the survey that 50% um, of the part-time workers said that they would want more hours um, at the gap, and 30, a good third say that if they had the option, they would work full-time at the gap. Time unionized workers. I'm not quite sure. My guess would be 30 years ago. There were there's still some full time unionized workers I know from doing grooming in the stores. Very few. Thank you. Um, so I have a question about the survey that the like employees took. I don't remember if you guys said you did a survey like. I'm wondering if you did the survey before and after, and if there was a question about like workers uh, like satisfaction um, with their work, and if that increased or not. Um, what we call baseline and um, intervention surveys, and we have those. We have not done a lot of analyses of those. We focused on the business results, and we haven't. Um, done the rigorous analyses yet. Uh, what we can see is that uh, in a lot of the outcomes, or at least in terms of employees' perceptions of like their schedule input and um, their ability to, you know, the predictability, we see no differences at baseline between our control and treatment stores, and we see differences at wave two and in the direction that we would like to see. <laughs> um, and so we are optimistic that um, we will you know, observe at the employee level um, that, the, the, um, you know, that the intervention made a difference. And then we also have, in the surveys, we have a whole bunch of um, outcome variables, such as stress and financial hardship and uh, pre, you know, how parents manage their time. And so that's the next step. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. We, we do pre-post data in reported in a Harvard Business Review article describing the impact of the shift messenger intervention. That's the only thing that we've crunched so far. And they Thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if you controlled for changes in hourly wages or whether you looked at changes in net weekly earnings. I can tell you that there's not a lot of variation there. <laughs> there's a, there are differences between what the full-time associates are, but our focus was on part-time and, you know, um, that will be a good thing to do, especially when we do the uh, employee level analyses. We will definitely control for wages, but there's not a lot of variation there. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, uh, Joan, at least twice that you think there's um, policy implications or implications for regulation um, of these findings on the business side. I was just interested to hear more about what you think those are and maybe how they map on to the um, current uh, proposals and legislation around scheduling. Yeah. Sure. 
as I you know mentioned, you know we we have this um, information that um, when there's a call to post schedules two weeks in advance and to not use rely on on call shifts. The managers seem to be able to do that and still meet their numbers. And so those are two basic um, um, components of almost all the legislation. I think overall, the larger issue um, is the broader picture that we, you know, if you've gone to some of these hearings, employers will tell the story that Siravanan had started with that our study helps counter. We can't provide more stable schedules. We can't provide more predictability because it's the market, it's traffic, we can't predict it. And I think that our study helps um, you know, helps demonstrate that those basic assumptions are just not, um, as credible as, you know, I don't mean to say that the employers who testify don't feel that it's that way. They, I think they're, they're not misrepresenting their experiences whatsoever. But perhaps if they took a hard look at how much their traffic really does vary and what is driving the instability that, the, that their managers are experiencing, they might come to the same conclusions that we have in the study, that they could do this. The way they the way they handle labor labor is that they um, that where they start for their labor budget for this year is with how many people were in the store last year and um, then they make some adjustments. But when you think about it, if there is a systematic process that they are using that is depressing sales, they are carrying forward that year after year because of the way they design um, labor budgets. So uh, I, I mean, our, we do not know what the stability sweet spot is in terms of what is the sweet spot where you have driven down those front end labor costs, matching labor supply and labor demand to the maximum extent that you can without driving up the back end labor costs. We don't have that. Um, data point, but what we do have is the data point that employer, that least gap, was not at the stability sweet point, uh, sweet point, and so the market is not functioning um, the way that we would all hope it would, uh, and that the, the you know that the companies would as well. So this is really fascinating and going to the question about policy implications, a lot of the laws that we see moving in cities and states also apply to restaurants and this might be a completely unfair question, but to what extent do you feel you can we can extrapolate from your research to um, restaurants, maybe at the very least sort of big box, you know, TGI Fridays type restaurants? I'm actually part of an um, evaluation team for the city of Seattle. And um, as part of that, we're going in and talking to employers uh, in Seattle about their scheduling practices. And we, um, our baseline uh, report, I think, is being released tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but um, what? And so we go into restaurants, and we in both fast food and full service. And boy, you know. Um, they are every bit as unstable and unpredictable and in some ways multiplied by pi in terms of a, a lot of the schedules that we see, for example, there's a start time. There's no end time ever listed. You stay until all your customers are gone. You stay until it closes. You stay whatever. They don't even put end times on their schedules, just as an example. So um, the question will be, the same questions that we've addressed here. How much does there, is that really driven by how many people walk in and by the weather, which is what a lot of Seattle um, restaurant people will say, you know, and how much of it is really predictable. We see enough variation between restaurants there and even within the same firm to suggest that there is some room for improving schedules in you know, in restaurants and in food, in fast food. To be deeply impacted by unstable scheduling are retail, hospitality, so that includes hotels as well as restaurants, um, and healthcare. 
where you also have these very, but when you think about it, that is a huge segment of the American economy. That is a huge segment of the low wage workforce. And it's a huge segment of women who are working um, low wage jobs. Yeah, you were, I think, getting to this a little bit. Um, it sounds like a lot of what you're talking about is we know that when we give people a number to look at and then ask them to make decisions, they will make decisions based on optimizing that specific number. So if you're looking at labor costs and store traffic, you will optimize all your other decisions to get to whatever, whatever point you're thinking about for those two numbers. So I was curious about whether you had thought about um, you know, you don't, you said you haven't figured out what the optimal point would be um, for schedule stability, but if you wanted to set up a system that sort of pushed scheduling software, or pushed managers to move towards schedule stability, have you thought at all about what sorts of input numbers um, or metrics or measurements that you would want them to be focusing on instead of store traffic and minimizing labor costs? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, you know, clearly managers respond very well to incentives, and the incentives are usually tied to metrics, right? So as we say, what we cannot measure, we don't, we can't manage. I think the first step towards having stable schedules is probably, you know, developing or using some of the metrics that we already have in the study, and for retailers to possibly, you know, uh, follow through and see how different stores are performing on those metrics. Uh, now, in terms of taking those metrics and putting it into incentives, I think uh, you know there's probably a long way to get there, but uh, but uh, you know that seems like a good direction. But so far, it, it, you know, just the employee satisfaction metric is doesn't typically show up in any store. Uh, you know, as far as I know, like many store managers' compensation plan. Another key yeah. metric. how well store policies are executed and um, um, that, and then also customer satisfaction and conversion rates. In other words, when you walk into the store, do you um, end up buying? And what's the basket value of how do you end up buying a little bit or a lot? Um, and those Companies keep those metrics, but they're not consider, considered relevant to scheduling practices. All of those metrics are relevant to scheduling practices. And so what companies really need to do is just kind of do capitalism of like, here's the money you're saving by tightly scheduling, but here's the, here are the costs that you're generating by tightly scheduling. And we're in a situation too often right now where they're focused on the first number and they're not counting the second number. And that's actually just flawed business metrics. Sorry, I have one more question. Um, I'm wondering if there's any concern that that a 7% increase in sales would be due to like seasonal variation of sales or if you guys were able to control for that and how you controlled for that. So uh, that's a great question. So any, any analysis that you do in retail, you need to take seasonality into account. And uh, one of the big benefits of this experimental design was we had treatment and control stores. Right, so this is a purely experimental design, and we have an economist here, so she might agree that this is probably as far, I know, as good as you can get when it comes to inferring results. And so we control for seasonality, uh, you know, weather patterns, everything that is possible. Yeah. Thanks. I was just wondering if GAP is planning to or has implemented any of the um, five additional uh, changes you made, including the Shift Messenger app. Authorized to speak for GAP, so and then and we you know we are independent researchers, so that's a better question for GAP. Um, and. I think what is so remarkable that is that as a company that had very, very um, 
unpredictable part-time schedules that then move to a whole bunch of positive changes for the workforce and that it's seen benefits for the company. Um, and it, I think it also demonstrates how hard it is for companies to change their scheduling practices. We, we work with Gap Associates at Old Navy, who, you know, as a, as a Gap brand, who still really struggle off with these issues. And so it really does take corporate level leadership and then a whole process as the study really like exemplified to really implement this into the daily operations. Um, but I think it does demonstrate that when companies have incentives like it's good for their business, I think it, it starts to open up a whole new pathway for um, more employers to change. Great. Um, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today and also for this great discussion. And a huge thank you to our presenters for sharing your findings with us. And I want to make a last plug for April 24th, 5.30 to 7.30 p.m., our research on TAP Happy Hour, which is a conversation series um, and a space for drinks, dialogue, and debate. The discussion will be on gender pay equality and economic growth. Um, and there will be more details about that forthcoming. And so thank you, everyone.